Hey guys, welcome back to Harbour Unboxed. Today I'll be checking out a game that ranked very highly on everyone's top 10 list for 2017. That game is of course Mass Effect Andromeda, and for good reason. The Mass Effect series has been very solid since day one, and as such has developed a huge fan base. And that fan base has been very keen for an update, as it's been something like five years since we saw the last instalment in the Mass Effect series. As the fourth instalment in the Mass Effect series, Andromeda promises to be bigger and more beautiful, and based on initial impressions, it certainly looks as though the game delivers on those promises. That said, there are a few issues, namely the game's poor animations, which do spoil the single player experience somewhat. Previously, the Mass Effect games were built upon the Unreal Engine, but with Andromeda, a shift to Frostbite 3 was made. This move meant that Bioware had to build all systems, tools, and assets from scratch. Ironically, a big part of the switch was to help enhance character animation, so I hope they had more success in other areas. Although the Frostbite 3 game engine does support DirectX 12, the developer has opted to stick with DX11, at least for now anyway. That's not totally surprising though, as despite delivering many visually impressive Mass Effect games over the years, this series has never really pushed game engines to their limits. The previous three installments all used DirectX 9 for example. Even 2012's Mass Effect 3 stuck with DirectX 9 despite wide use of DirectX 10 at the time, and even the availability of DirectX 11. For PC players, the developer recommends gamers run with either the Intel Core i7-4790 or the AMD FX8350, which is a very odd contrast. Surely a lower end Core i5 processor will suffice if they're recommending an FX8350. Clearly these recommendations were made before Ryzen landed. On the graphics card side, it suggested that gamers arm themselves with at least a GTX 1060 3GB or a GTX 970 graphics card. Apparently if you are using a Radon graphics card, you're out of luck. Obviously something like the RX 470 will suffice if they're recommending a GTX 1063 GB. By failing to mention a single AMD graphics card, it's quite clear that this is an Nvidia sponsored title, so you can expect the green team to have the upper hand, at least out of the gate. That said, AMD who seem to be very much on top of their driver game right now have already released an update to better support the game. AMD is claiming performance gains of up to 12% on the Radeon RX 480 with an i7-6700K and 8GB of DDR4-2066 memory. That boost sees frame rates go from 53.7fps to a much healthier 60.1fps at 1080p. Likely contributing to these performance games, or at least a good chunk of them, is the added optimised tessellation profile for the game. So for testing we used the AMD Radeon Crimson Edition graphics driver 17.3.2 for testing the Radeon GPUs and the NVIDIA based GPUs were tested using the GeForce Game Ready driver 378.78. We benchmark using the Core i7-7700K test machine, which sees the processor running at 4.9GHz with 32GB of DDR4-3000 memory. The performance numbers that you're about to see are based on a 60 second frat pass from the beginning of the single player campaign after the player controlled character crash lands, falls, onto Habitat 7. Since EA's Origin game client locks you out of the game for 24 hours after five hardware changes are made to either like the graphics card or the CPU, this made testing painfully slow. In the end I had to purchase three copies of the game on three separate accounts just so I could test 15 configurations per day. Finally for testing we have focused our attention on the ultra quality preset and I have to say at these quality settings the game looks phenomenal. We also tested at the three standard resolutions being 1080p, 1440p and 4k. Before we jump to the benchmark results here's just a quick look at the Fraps Pass. I'll show 10 or 15 seconds of it and then I'll slide it up into the top corner there and we'll start looking at the results and discuss those. Tip. Don't breathe the air. Found that out the hard way. You think that energy cloud we saw could cause all this? Sam said it's dark energy, but that's in space. Even with AMD's recent driver update, the GTX 980 Ti still enjoys a serious performance advantage over the Fury X, delivering 24% more frames on average. The 980 Ti looks very comfortable with a 71 FPS minimum, while the Fury X dropped down to 54 FPS, and the standard 980 is slightly slower again at 53 FPS. I have to say, it's not often you see the GTX 970 beating the R9 390X with ease, and that's the current situation here. 
The same is true when comparing the R9 380 to the GTX 960. The GeForce graphics card is a whisker faster here and just able to deliver playable performance at 1080p using the ultra quality settings. The same can't be said sadly for the R7 370 and GTX 950 though. Pumping the resolution up to 1440p really hammers performance and now we're looking at just 53 FPS on average from the GTX 980 Ti with a 46 FPS minimum. Despite that though, the 980 Ti was still 23% faster than the Fury X, which averaged just 43 FPS. For a minimum of 30 FPS, gamers will require the R9 390X or GTX 970 if they wish to play at 1440p with all the eye candy turned up. Right, so given what we've seen at the previously tested resolutions, it's no surprise that even the GTX 980 Ti can't deliver playable performance at the 4K resolution. Here we see an average of just 28 FPS with a minimum of 24 FPS. The latest crop of GPUs offer more models capable of pushing over 60 FPS at 1080p as you might have expected. The Titan XP and GTX 1080 Ti were good for over 100 FPS at all times and averaged around 120 FPS. The GTX 1080 was also very respectable, often pushing frame rates above 100 FPS. It was a rather large drop down to the GTX 1070, but even so with almost 80 FPS on average, performance was still very impressive. The GTX 1060 6GB easily beats the RX 480 despite AMD's recent driver update, and here we see the 480 8GB delivering similar performance to the 3GB 1060. Still, we found that GPUs such as the RX 470 and GTX 1050 Ti were still able to deliver playable performance at 1080p. Even at 1440p, we see that you can achieve playable performance with the RX 470, 4GB RX 480, and 3GB GTX 1060, if only just. Having said that though, ideally gamers will want at least a GTX 1070, and we do see a rather good argument for going with the GTX 1080 here as it provided 31% more performance, taking the average frame rate to 71 FPS. Again, the GTX 1080 Ti was just 15% faster than the standard GTX 1080, and frankly I was hoping to see more from Nvidia's new $700 GPU. Now again at the 4K resolution we find that very few GPUs are capable of delivering smooth performance. The GTX 1080 just gets by with a 38 FPS average and a 33 FPS minimum. Then we have the GTX 1080 Ti, which delivered just 13% more performance, though I have to say the gains were more noticeable here. Here we have more bars than Alcatraz, as I attempt to squeeze all 26 GPUs tested into a single graph. Here we see that the 980 Ti roughly matched the GTX 1070, and both really put the Fury X in its place. Meanwhile, the 3GB 1060 is on par with the R9 Nano. Again, this isn't something you often see, if ever. AMD claims that with the latest driver, the RX 480 went from 54 FPS in their testing to 60 FPS. Well, using that very driver, we saw 53 FPS on average. This was a clean driver install, so there was nothing left behind that could upset performance. So either AMD hasn't made any improvements yet, or the performance that we would have seen without this driver would have looked very bad indeed. I haven't had time to look into this yet, and with Origin constantly locking me out of my multiple copies, it's made making further tests a little bit challenging. So I'll have to look into that tomorrow. Moving to 1440p, we see similar margins, though this time the GTX 1060 6GB does fall behind the Fury X and the standard Fury. That said, the 3GB GTX 1060 was still faster than the RX 488GB and R9 390 GPUs. Finally, at 4K, we once again find that there are very few GPUs available right now that will cut it. In fact, even the Titan XP and GTX 1080 Ti dip below 40 FPS at times, which obviously isn't ideal. Before wrapping testing up, let's see how the GTX 1060 6GB versus RX 480 8GB compare side by side in the first 30 seconds or so of our benchmark. As you can see, although the GTX 1060 came out 8% faster at 1080p, the overall performance was quite similar. The reason for the larger than expected performance variance is down to the fact that when the RX 480 is seen bottoming out at around 48 FPS, the GTX 1060 is still pushing around 54 FPS, or 13% more frames. I should also mention that the results seen previously in graph form are based on an average of three runs, so the RX 480 minimums aren't unusual, you will constantly see them. Before wrapping things up, I thought it'd be cool to see how the 7700K clocked at 4.9 GHz compares to the Ryzen 7 1800X with all cores clocked at 4 GHz using the Titan XP. For the most part, performance was very similar, especially in areas where we were seeing heavier CPU load. For those of you wondering, the CPU utilization looked much the same in the multiplayer portion of the game. 
Well, there you have it, a fairly in-depth look at what it takes to play Mass Effect and all of its glory on the PC. Ideally though, I would have liked to have included a few more tests and look at things such as quality scaling for say the GTX 1060 and RX 480, but ran out of time thanks to Origin constantly locking me out for a 24 hour period due to too many hardware changes. So depending on how I go for time over the next few days, I would like to revisit the game for more GPU testing and even some CPU testing. That said, if I don't get around to doing that right away, you can expect to see more testing in the new future, as I will be adding this title to the battery of games that I already test with. Overall, Mass Effect Andromeda is an amazing looking game that seems like a lot of fun to play. I also had a quick go at the survival type online multiplayer mode where you join a team of other players and try to defend wave after wave of AI enemies. And yeah, that was a lot of fun as well. Anyway, that's all for this one. I have some more cool content coming later in the week, so watch your inbox. I'm your host, Steve. Hope to see you again soon.